superbug fungus, artificial wombs, and genetic memories. Plus this day in history with the polio vaccine and our song of the day by Melody Sheep. On your Morning Monarchy for April 26, 2017, I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever, whenever you are in the world for a delicious, nutritious look at what's really going on in the news. It's Wednesday. That means Food World Order Day, and we are glad you're here. A couple seconds after 9 a.m., and we're always live at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, Monday through Friday at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. A huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying your Morning Monarchy podcast, and a huger thanks to RadioConfluence.com for not only carrying the rebroadcast of your Media Monarchy shows, but also simulcasting them. Huge thanks to Jared and the growing community at RadioConfluence.com. They're not hating the media, they are becoming the media. And a huge thanks to all our supporters and subscribers and donors and fans and listeners and all of you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the PayPal, the Patreon, the Bitcoin, and the post office box. If you can give a little, I can give a lot. And this just in a couple minutes right before airtime. Christian S., our latest patron on Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy. Super huge thanks, Christian, and to everybody else who's taken the plunge over on Patreon.com. That's, that's what keeps us going. We're glad you're here for a Wednesday Food World Order edition. Each day of your morning monarchy, we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday is world news, Tuesday's tech, Wednesday is food, health, and environment. That means tomorrow's crazy occult chaos. And Friday is the media memes, the entertainment industrial complex. A lot of hype about today, April 26th. I mean, it's already 9 a.m. here on the West Coast, which means it's already noon on the East Coast. Now, I believe we have Trump calling all the Congress critters from the Senate I think that's at 3 p.m. East Coast time, so noon West Coast. And they're all allegedly going to talk about North Korea. This is while we're also soaking in Operation Gotham Shield and a lot of other hype going on all around the world. We are not big hype mongers. We are not big threataganda pushers. We do want to be aware of it. We want to know what's going on. I sent a link yesterday to Swag of... Here's this giant Reddit list of articles and things. This will probably keep you up late at night wondering and speculating about what may or may not happen. James Corbett and I were emailing a little bit earlier. Of course, we're going to tape the latest episode of New World next week a little bit later today. And that's one of those stories where, you know, we tape and we're not published for another 12 hours usually, at least. What are we going to do? Talk about that when it's essentially over? Now, again... We'll keep track of everything going on, and I appreciate you guys. This show is not only crowdfunded, but also crowdsourced. You can submit news using hashtag FoodWorldOrder or any of the other appropriate hashtags to get us covered and to get us to look at what's really going on, and I appreciate you being here. Again, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. I've been doing this for a little while. Glad you're here as we move forward. Let's glance, glance, glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into the menu of Food World Order. 100 Days, the ridiculous benchmark. Are these stories all going to be from the Washington Post? No, only one, two are from the Washington Post today. The rest are CNN, the New York Times, the Hill, National Catholic Reporter. Oh, that's right. I saw late last night. The Pope does a surprise TED Talk. We might have to talk about that on tomorrow's Holy Hexes episode of Your Morning Monarchy. But I don't really see anything all that fascinating going on, and I think it's better that we just dive in to the food, health, and environment news. I coined the phrase food world order many years ago on the air, and we've been using it ever since. It's fun when we can continue from where we left off on the previous episode. Tuesday, Cyberspace War, Tech Day. So now we move into food, health, and environment news, but I think we can transition pretty easily as group lobbies for cell service in Kootenay National Park. That's Vancouver, B.C.'s Kootenay National Park. It might be rustic, uninhabited, and rugged, but one group says the park's lack of cell phone service also makes it dangerous. If you've ever driven Highway 93 through Kootenay National Park, you know that it is spectacular. The highway meanders along the western slope of the Rocky Mountains. But don't try to tweet out any photos while you're there. Kootenay National Park has no cell service. To some, it's a chance to unplug and enjoy nature. Others say it's dangerous, especially along a busy highway. Tracy Litchfield thinks cell service is needed in the park. She and like-minded people have formed the group called the Committee to Secure Communication Facilities in Kootenay National Park. She's on the line from Windermere this morning. Good morning, Tracy. Good morning. Describe this stretch of highway through the park for us. Um, Well, it stretches 
from um, uh, for about 104 kilometers, and um, it's considered 93 south, and about 90 kilometers of it has uh, no cell phone service. Okay, it's is it a high mountain road? Or is it narrow and winding? What what's the road like itself? Um, it's a it's a high mountain pass. Um, it has uh, some windy stretches, and it also has some uh, straight stretches that allows people to speed along there pretty good. Okay, why do you think cell service is needed there? Um, we we think it's a safety issue. It, um, if you are in an accident of any kind you have to rely on Parks Canada personnel coming by to find you or a truck driver passing through that has a, a VHF radio to call in your to call in the accident. Won't somebody please think of the children? Now, interestingly enough, tell us, the service provider in the area, in a statement to the CBC, tell us said they conducted a feasibility study in 2012 on how to provide continuous cell service. The company said there is no reliable power service, power source rather, in the park to power its wireless sites to connect them to the broader TELUS network. Putting them in wouldn't be appropriate for the national park, a telecom company said. That seems pretty surprising. But they must know. Companies look at things as how they can make money. They realize this is probably not a money-making operation. Won't somebody please think of the children? This is why how these things are always pushed. Won't you think of the kids? Won't you think of your poor grandparents? They play on your heartstrings. Here's an idea from the chat. Get a radio, morons. If you're that afraid, or maybe if you have perhaps persistent health issues. Please, Daddy Government, take care of me when I hurt myself in the parks that you allow me to play in. This is the Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy, and we got a lot of headlines, so let's just keep rolling. A superbug fungus is emerging as a new menace to society in U.S. hospitals, yet mostly in New York and New Jersey. First identified in Japan in 2009, the fungus has spread to more than a dozen countries around the globe. The oldest of the 66 cases reported in the U.S. dates back to 2013, but most were reported last year. The fungus called Candida auris is a harmful form of yeast. Scientists say it can be hard to identify with standard lab tests. U.S. health officials sounded alarms last year because two of the three kinds of commonly used antifungal drugs have little effect. It's acting like a superbug bacteria, said Dr. Paige Armstrong for the Centers for Disease Creation, most vulnerable and fragile hospital patients, particularly newborns and the elderly. It tends to be diagnosed in patients after they've been in the hospitals for several weeks. Gosh, hmm. Are you you saying they tend to get sicker when they're in the disease industry? Would you like to get sick? Please come spend time in a hospital. Hey, would you like to learn how to be a criminal? Please join us in our prison industrial complex. Hey, would you like to learn how to be stupider? Please enroll in our schools. Would you like to become poor? Please use our banks, our central banks especially. Would you like to be emotionally and spiritually bankrupt? Please join us at our houses of worship. Everything is corrupt. All the organizations, all the institutions. Decentralize. Remove yourselves from them and build them yourselves. And we see this when we look at our food. The over-application of everything pretty much leads it to being useless. Now it gets pretty scary and gets pretty gross. And unfortunately, not a huge surprise, as we've talked about this. And we'll actually talk about a little more on vaccines at the end of this episode with This Day in History. But right now, on this day, April 26, 2017, the shingles vaccine from Merck is giving people shingles. By now, I think most people have seen the commercials on television telling us that if we've ever had the chicken pox at any point in our lives, then the shingles virus is already inside of us. Now, as it stands right now, there is a vaccine for shingles called Zostavax, but what we're finding out now about this vaccine kind of makes it seem like it might be uh, uh, pretty dangerous or at least cause some side effects that are actually the same as what we'd see from shingles. Joining me now to talk a little bit more about this is attorney Troy Bauck. Troy, thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome, Farron. Good to be here. Well, okay, so with this Zostavax, 
vaccine uh, for the shingles. Tell us a little bit about what Zostavax actually is. What is it supposed to do? How does it work and who makes it? Okay. Uh, Zostavax is made by Merck and it's supposed to prevent shingles. Um, it's, um, it's been around since about 2006 and it uses a, a live strain of virus to make the vaccine. And some vaccines use live strains, others don't. And the problem is when you use a live strain of virus in a vaccine, it has the possibility of that live strain causing what you're trying to prevent. And in this case, shingles. And shingles, you know, a lot of people think of this as a, uh, mostly as a painful, irritating uh, skin condition, but there's actually a lot more to what shingles does to the body. And we'll leave that to you to go watch the rest of that clip. That, of course, does come from the Ring of Fire. And another example. Yes, oh yeah, there's a live virus inside the vaccine, and it, you know, it might give you the thing you think you're not going to get. Thus spake Zostavax. You're listening to the Morning Monarchy Food World Order Edition. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Boy, I got some heat when I talk some smack about someone's favorite politician. His name is Sonny Perdue. He used to be the governor of Georgia, and now he's over the head of ag, and he has been sworn in. President Donald Trump's choice to lead the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue III, has received almost $1 million over the last two decades from the very industry that he's now required to regulate. Purdue has received a total of nearly $20 million in contributions since the 1992 election cycle. Purdue was elected to the Georgia Senate in 92, served there until 01. He was elected as state's governor in 02, a post he held until 2011. During his political career in Georgia, Purdue has received about $3.7 million from the finance, insurance, and real estate sector, the largest share of the contributions he received. Four other industries have provided his campaign with some more... With more money than the agriculture business, Purdue, however, has benefited from donations and corporate agricultural interests. About 40% of his total contributions came from corporations or other non-individual donors, a much higher share than other Trump cabinet selections who held state offices, such as Rick Perry, who's now at the Department of Energy, and Scott Pruitt, who's now at the EPA. And within the agriculture industry, almost half of his contributions were made by non-individuals, including such companies as Monsanto, John Deere, Tyson Foods. Purdue received financial support from a range of corporate agricultural interests. Corporate donations made up more than half of all contributions within the poultry and eggs, timber, paper, and chemicals sector. Sonny Purdue don't give a shit about you, like all the rest. And that's how they go. It's not all bad news, or as we maybe sometimes call it on New World Next Week, not unmitigated good news. And there are some downsides to this, but we look at the failing, flailing big food corporations. Some of them aren't doing real well. McDonald's, you think, might be on the decline? Think again. Their stock just hit an all-time high. In other McDonald's news, strange McDonald's news, they unveiled these bizarre uniforms. Wearing a uniform, as KCCI reports, is tough in any job, especially in food service. Now, I actually fortunately avoided any kind of hefty uniforms, I think, the most uniformy thing I probably had to wear, aside from, you know, aprons at a few different jobs, which that's hardly a uniform. I had to wear the sort of the polo shirt with the name tag, with the ball cap. And I had really long hair, and I would just kind of twist up my hair and hide it up under the hat, and even the boss would come and hit. I'm like, hey, you got kind of a growth there under your hat, buddy. You might want to get that checked out. That was back at the Comfort Inn days. I used to work at a hotel restaurant. That was actually my first big job, and that was actually the one that <laughs> I, had them, I had them put me on Sunday so I could weasel out of going to church. According to McDonald's press release, these new uniforms were designed as a collaboration between Bindu Rivas and Wariri Boswell, 
who actually worked at a McDonald's in California before he started designing for strange androgynous celebrities like Will Smith and Ellen DeGeneres. The new look has debuted this month at all 14,000 McDonald's restaurants. Our new collections focus on comfort, fit, functionality, and contemporary professionalism, delivering a uniform that crew and managers will feel comfortable to work in and proud to wear, says Jez Langhorn, McDonald's Senior Director of HR. Beyond that, it's another step in the company's continuous effort to raise the bar by investing in people and yabbity blah blah They basically look, as people have pointed out from Up Rocks to Matthew Dempster, they look like something exactly out of Logan's Run or Hunger Games. And those are the new uniforms. And we are, of course, living the Hunger Games. And, of course, they will be sewn together by slaves in third world Asian countries. But in a victory for public health, the board of the Los Angeles Unified School District, the second largest school district in the country, adopted a resolution to end McDonald's McTeachers Nights this April. McTeachers is hilarious. The resolution comes as millions of parents, educators, and health pros call on junk food corporations to stop kid-targeting marketing. To date, United Teachers Los Angeles, the National Education Association, and more than 50 state and local teachers unions, representing more than 3 million educators nationwide, have demanded junk food corporations stop marketing to children in schools. McTeachers Nights are events at which McDonald's invites teachers to work behind a McDonald's counter and serve burgers and fries and soda to students, their families, and other people eating garbage at their restaurant. McDonald's, in turn, donates a small percentage of the night's proceeds to the school, often amounting to a dollar or two per student. While McDonald's enjoys free labor and the kind of marketing money can't buy, schools are left with negligible proceeds, and teachers must face the impossible challenge of choosing between much-needed funds and educating students about health. And basically acting like a tool. I mean, it would be one thing back in back in our day, you probably wouldn't get a picture of this. But in this day and age, aside from just all of the, the couple of bucks you get off a student for quite literally prostituting yourself, or it's just maybe moonlighting, they're going to take pictures of you. They're going to laugh their asses off at you. That is until they probably join them in line to get a job at McDonald's. For the first time in its 52 years of operation, Scrubway announced that it's contracted in 2016. They, well, I, I misread that. They contracted, meaning they got smaller. You know, like cold makes you contract and heat makes you expand. Subway is shuttering 359 U.S. locations, which, as Bloomberg described, was the biggest retrenchment in the history of the restaurant chain, whose total store count dropped 1.3% from 27,103 in 2015 to 26,744, even as it remained the most ubiquitous fast food eatery in the U.S., although McDonald's still tops it by sales. Sales for 2016 reflect our focus on international growth, the Connecticut-based company said in a statement. We're undertaking an exciting transformation that includes yabbity blah blah. That includes not selling gym mats and having pedophiles as their spokesperson. Those are pretty, pretty, pretty simple moves you generally want to make in any kind of company. Okay, check. Are we feeding people pink slime and gym mats? No? Excellent. Are our employees known child molesters? No. Good deal. Two out of three ain't bad. Coca-Cola, meanwhile, said it's going to cut 1,200 jobs, the latest food manufacturer, to accelerate cost-cutting efforts as the industry struggles with a weak growth outlook. The soda giant said it would trim the jobs beginning in the second half of 2017 and carrying into 2018 as it tries to become faster, more agile, or as we would say, fitter, happier, more productive. I also noticed today from Financial Times, you got to follow them on the tweets. It's going to have actual real financial news. I think a lot of the first quarter results are coming out. So I saw lots of places that said, oh, so-and-so beat their first quarter results. Oh, these other people didn't meet their first quarter needs. While these necessary changes are always very difficult, they'll help us do fewer things better to lead and support our operating units, said James Quincy, who will succeed Mutar Kent to become the CEO of Coke this year. Overall, the soda manufacturer said it would expand the company's current cost-saving programs by $800 million to $3.8 billion. 
They think they're going to save $3.8 billion. Quincy said the company aims to reinvest at least half of its savings, though Coke is still finalizing a complete plan for how it will use all the savings beyond simply saying it would create value for shareholders. Coke's move to cut jobs comes as many major food and beverage manufacturers, a group collectively known as Big Poison Food, have cut thousands of jobs in a bid to trim costs and restructure their operations because people don't want to buy their poison anymore because they all have supercomputers in their back pocket that if they use them effectively, they'll realize that they can vote with their dollar and not continue to buy poison and kill themselves and poison their children. This article from Fortune did not say that. Other jobs, others that have cut jobs, rather, include Hershey Highway, GM, that, that stands for Genetically Modified General Mills, and, of course, the I Invented Cornflakes to Stop You from Masturbating Kellogg. All have been under pressure to cut costs to boost cash flows because of the aggressiveness at 3G-backed Kraft Heinz, which we've talked about recently, which has put some pressure on the others in the industry to step up their game. Kraft Heinz, of course, getting into bed with Unilever and all those other guys doing pretty well. And that's why they buy up the smaller companies. That's that's the warning. We can even maybe, if we have time, talk about that briefly when we're doing this day in history as it relates to Beck and Geffen and Bongload. I like this story and a huge thanks to our buddy Head in a Jar on the tweets. Beer drinker sues Miller Coors for falsely implying that Foster's is brewed in Australia. Foster's, Australian for Budweiser. Leaf Nelson versus Miller Coors. This is a class action on behalf of consumers of Foster's beer who have been deceived that Foster's, a historically Australian beer, is manufactured in and imported from Australia. Defendant has committed unfair and deceptive practices and has been unjustly enriched by marketing and selling beer in a way that misleads consumers into believing that Foster's beer is still imported from Australia using the slogan Foster's, Australian for beer, and selling Foster's beer at prices substantially higher than domestic beer, despite the fact that the beer is now brewed in the United States with domestic ingredients. I love this court case. It calls out the BS of marketing, and it calls out the BS of advertising. You've heard me tell this story a million times because I saw it as I worked at the grocery store. Like a lot of things I saw while I worked at the grocery store. <laughs> yes, and selling fake Australian beer is a bootable offense. The moment Budweiser sold out to InBev, massive Belgian company, the very second Budweiser ceased to be an American product, they changed the label and put that new flag on it that says, The Great American Beer. They never had to say before that it was the Great American Beer because you knew it. It was implied. It was a part of an American tradition of, you know, Germans inventing all our things. Space race and otherwise. But they didn't have to lie about it on their label. Now, it's not American, and they slap, Oh, it's American. It's the great American beer. The moment they sold out, they began to lie. I just find that just very fundamentally important to the way we kind of look at what we eat and what we consume, both down our gullet but in our brains. Now, if you follow the tweets, you will get a pretty amazingly well-rounded look at what's going on all around the world. And it's pretty nonstop. I think our Twitter account is pretty awesome, at Media Monarchy. It's our one main social media outlet that we use and that we've been using for, geez, nearly 10 years. And each day, I basically go through the hashtags and pick the most, best, appropriate stories to talk about on the show. But that's not all of them. There's always a ton of stories. And one of the things you'll find if you follow just the hashtag Food World Order, you'll find a lot of recall stories. Now, fortunately, the better and more local and natural you eat, these things are never really going to concern us. But there are some ridiculous recalls that you see sometimes. I think easily my favorite recall I've seen in a while. This comes from WRAL, and they tell you to check your freezer, but as we just noted, I don't have to. My freezer is filled with homemade organic broth and local whiskey. Harris Teeter frozen southern style hash browns have been recalled because they may be contaminated with extraneous golf ball materials. Yes, golf balls. 
North Carolina is included in the recall where this story comes from. And again, everything we say and play always included in the show notes. Every link, every video, every article, it's there. The specific recalled product in North Carolina is Harris Teeter brand two-pound bag of frozen southern-style hash browns. The press release from McCain Foods USA, that's extra points for extra funny, announced today it is voluntarily recalling retail frozen hash brown products that may be contaminated with extraneous golf ball materials that, despite our stringent supply standards, may have been inadvertently harvested with potatoes used to make this product. Consumption of these products may pose a choking hazard or other physical injury to the mouth. Up in your mouth. So when I finally read their press release, I guess, I suppose it at least makes some sort of sense. Oh, there were golf balls in the potato fields because it was probably Kramer out hitting golf balls out into the uh, potato fields, right? And then they just get harvested up that way. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. The fine southern tradition of golf balls. I mean, that's almost like a, a, a fraudulent thing, right? Fraud in the food market has been the target of a massive global operation with the seizure of 230 million euros worth of fake food and drinks. A joint operation by Interpol and Europol was carried out in 61 countries with the focus on counterfeit and substandard products. In a statement, investigators said criminals give no thought to the human cost as long as they make a profit. Just one example, the presence of undeclared nuts in some products. You will not notice it because the taste will be more or less the same. But if you are allergic, you will definitely notice it and you obviously uh, can die out of it. Investigators say the items seized include everything from olive oil and alcohol to luxury items including caviar. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. You are listening to the Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy for Hump Day, Wednesday, April 26th. It's supposed to be a crazy day where the world ends. Hope you're doing well, whenever, wherever you are. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. That was a little bit about food fraud in the food market. It has been a target of a massive global operation with the seizure of more than 230 million euros worth of fake food and drinks. Fake olive oil is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, as long as we were talking about recalls and undeclared nuts, Springer, which is a science journal, is retracting 107 papers from one journal after discovering they've been accepted with fake peer reviews. 107. To submit a fake review, someone, often the author of the paper, either makes up an outside expert to review the paper or suggests a real researcher. And in both cases, provides a fake email address that comes back to someone who will invariably give the paper a glowing review. In this case, Springer the publisher of Tumor Biology through 2016, told us that an investigation produced clear evidence the reviews were submitted under the names of real researchers with faked emails. Some of the authors may have used a third-party editing service, which may have supplied the reviews. The journal is now published by SAGE, S-A-G-E. The retractions follow another sweep by the publisher last year when Tumor Biology retracted 25 papers for compromised review and other issues, mostly authored by researchers based in Iran. Goddamn Iran. I knew it. With the latest bunch of retractions, the journal has now retracted the most papers of any other journal, indexed by Clarivate Analytics Web of Science, formerly part of Thomson Reuters. In 2015, its impact factor 2.9 ranked it 104th out of 213 oncology journals. So we would just file that if we were doing this on New World Next Week under the crisis of scientism. Now, as we are trying to watch the breaking news to see what happens on Trump, April 2016. Or, or no, I'm sorry, Trump, April 26th. Trump, April 26th. And we're about to talk about 
artificial wombs, helping premature lamb fetuses grow for four weeks. In one little bit of sync, I can glance at the breaking news and tell you that Oscar-winning director Jonathan Demme, director of Silence of the Lambs, died in his apartment. He also directed Stop Making Sense, I believe. Maybe talk about that a little bit later, so that's just a little bit of breaking news for you. Just past 9.30 on your morning monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Extremely premature lambs have been kept alive in artificial uterus for four weeks. The system uses a fluid-filled plastic bag and could be used for premature babies within the next three years. We've developed a system that, as closely as possible, reproduces the environment of the womb and replaces the function of the placenta, says Alan Flake at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, who led the study. It's fascinating, says Neil Marlowe, University College London. People have been trying to do this for ages. But he says the system will have to undergo years of testing to be sure that it is safe for human babies. Flake and his colleagues developed their system with babies in mind. Being born extremely prematurely is the most common cause of death in babies. Infants born at 22 to 24 weeks instead of the full 40 weeks have only a 10% chance of survival, says Flake. Now, I had this is one of those stories that all around the same moment... Two, three, four people all end up sending me the same story in this weird Ziploc uterus. And I kind of, you know, there, again, there are times when I see certain photographs and certain images and certain illustrations. I can instantly go, oh, that's a fantastic album cover. And that's what I call the covers for our daily operations here, our daily episodes. Love to put together striking, provocative images. The illustration of a little lamb in a Ziploc bag with bloods and tubes all going to it is pretty interesting. That's probably going to be our album art for today. And then there was an update. And you can find this. We'll link it up for you. That basically has a video gif of this undulating lamb in an artificial womb. And it's a nice gif of it just twitching and moving and twitching and moving and twitching and moving. And I just had to add Lisa Simpson in and wonder, I thought you loved me. There's an interesting program out of the Netherlands. And while it was broadcast in Dutch, a lot of it is in English. I was going to pull a clip, but was having some technical difficulties, so we'll just include it here in the show. Food Flakes, Urban Agriculture as an Alternative to Inefficient Food Systems, looking at new future ways to make food. And these are probably going to be maybe the disruptions. You know, Elon Musk has a brother named Kimball, and his tech revolution starts with mustard greens. As Backchannel.com is reporting, Kimball Musk's tech revolution starts with mustard greens. The other Musk is leading a band of hipster Brooklyn farmers on a mission to overthrow Big Ag. And that's what's going to happen when people start setting up their own grow situations in their own places. (laughs) Because the lamb is out of the bag, you guys. People want to do things more themselves. They want to be healthier. There is a giant shift. Masses amounts of people... Cutting loose, decentralizing, cutting the cord, learning to do things for themselves, voting with their dollar, doing all of those things to not take part with the powers that shouldn't be. So much so that even local news places know, local communities, small towns, and that's what we're talking about. I mean, the little free libraries, about the tool libraries, the community kitchens, the sharing fridges, all of these ideas are growing massively. So we can even see it in... Arkansas with the Little Rock Kitchen Cabinet. The Little Rock Kitchen Cabinet kicking off a six-week series hoping to stir up a passion for healthy cooking in young chefs. The Kitchen Cabinet hosting these healthy eating classes in the Our Kids program. The organization is made up of a group of local restaurant owners and operators. Their series called Cooking Matters hopes to encourage people to make healthy eating choices while teaching them how to actually prepare those choices. Okay, so the Oak Care program showed me that it's helped me after years, and I've been going there since seventh grade, so keep me out of trouble and doing the right things. Gloves are nice to have every night. Participating restaurants include The Root Cafe, UA Pulaski Tech College, Culinary Arts, and Greenleaf Grill. And Rainer- Now, in all honesty, as I was watching that clip, and we're grabbing this from Fox16.com, 
It basically looks like a bunch of uninterested black kids got forced to go to a cooking class. Be that as it may, they're definitely still going to get the information. The goal of the program, which will offer hands-on cooking and nutrition classes once a week, is to encourage participants to make healthy eating choices and to teach them healthy, affordable recipes they can make at home. Can you imagine if they taught us how to make some food in school? They don't teach us any of that stuff. They don't teach you how to change a flat tire. They don't teach you how to cook a meal. They don't teach you how to balance your checkbook. They teach you how to sit and respond Pavlovian to when the bell or buzzer goes off. And you march off to your next place. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy, Food World Order Edition. And National Geographic has recently been doing their part to hashtag normalize cannibalism. But now they're going to help us normalize sniffing some poop. We don't eat food off dirty floors. We dutifully wash our hands. We steer away from the clearly infected. Or do we? It's all a part of avoiding things likely to make us sick. And new research shows our primate cousins do it too. Except the mandrill monkeys method is a bit more unsavory smelling each other's poop. By detecting the odor of intestinal parasites in their group members' feces, these Central African monkeys identify who is ill and then avoid grooming them. Grooming is important to mandrels. It soothes conflict and builds relationships as well as keeps fur and skin free of pests, but this social behavior can also spread parasites such as E. coli and other microbes that cause dysentery. We found that gastrointestinal parasites were present on the fur, so it's risky to groom a parasitized individual, said study leader Clements Poirot, <clears throat> an ecologist who works at ah, Typo. An ecologist who works with the Mandrillus Project, a multinational collaboration to study the world's only population of wild mandrills that are used to people. The population is so well habituated, they just don't care about us at all. We have the privilege to just observe what happens. And they're sniffing each other's poop. I feel like we've seen more and more and more stories that show animals can smell disease. They're quite literally sniffing out cancer. Now, if they could just be used to sniff out the cancer causes, not the cancer effects. I found an older article, and I thought, you know, like a lot of things, this is always one of your newsy 101 things. You see these new articles. One, click through to follow it all the way back to its original source, and then look at the date. A lot of stories, sometimes for various reasons, make their way back around into the news. Ben and Jerry's throws fudge brownie into GMO food fight. So we go from sniffing poop to throwing fudge. Hope you see what I did there. And this article is from August 1st, 2014, and it basically talks about how Unilever, the parent corporation of Ben and Jerry's, is basically letting them talk the GMO talk. I don't think they'll ever want to poten- want the potentially massive negative PR of trying to silence B&J. Ben and Jerry's tried to push for the California labeling law, which, of course, Unilever spent tons of money, tons of money, to stop it. Ben and Jerry's sold out to Unilever many, many moons ago. Seventh generation, they sold out to Unilever last year. That's why we stopped buying their products. We will keep you up to date on who sells out to what. Because, again, there's no excuse for not knowing who owns what. I'm a big fan of, I've told you, of of bubble water, sparkling water. It was really how I kind of beat the soda demon. But pretty much every bubble water company, it's all owned by Nestle. We've actually got one that we use. It's through the local grocery store, and it's their label. It's their sort of shelf brand. So we can make those decisions. We can find those things out. We can stop buying things that are owned by companies we don't like. Because again, if we go back to McDonald's and Coke and Subway and all those guys, they know the gig is up in a lot of ways and they have to change their game, which is why they're trying to buy up all the competition. Darja Mail still writes for Tom Dispatch and Truthout and we have 
many, many, many articles through the archives of Media Monarchy as we followed the military's war on sea life. It's war in the Gulf, and the U.S. Navy is on hand to protect us. Not that Gulf. Talking about the Gulf of Alaska, and it's actually a mock war. That is, if you don't happen to be a fin whale or a wild salmon. This May, the Navy will again sail its warships into the Gulf of Alaska. There, they will engage in military maneuvers and possibly drop bombs, launch torpedoes and missiles, and engage in activities that stand a significant chance of poisoning those once pristine waters while it prepares for future battles elsewhere on the planet. Think of it as a war against wildlife, an assault on the environment and local coastal communities, and call it irony or call it American life in 2017, but the U.S. military's Alaska Command has branded Emily Stolarchek a troublemaker for insistently pointing this out. In a state where such a phrase is the equivalent of an obscenity, some have bluntly called her anti-military. The office of Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski has termed her a rabble-rouser while a Kodiak assembly member labeled some of what she's been saying about the Navy as just silly. As a resident of the tiny fishing town of Cordova, Alaska, the most radical rabble-rousing thing about Stolarchek may be the passion with which she loves this region of the planet in all its majesty. Majesty. That's why she's taken a fierce and unwavering stand for years now against the ongoing training exercises the Navy carries out in the Gulf of Alaska during one of the largest migrations of birds and marine life on Earth. These exercises, which inject tons of toxic materials into the Gulf and use significant explosive ordnance, are once again scheduled, scheduled to take place just as Alaska's commercial fishing season opens. The Navy plays violent war games in Alaska, killing fish and destroying the environment, and it's just par for the course. They're just, you know, they're just trying to make America great again. Better news out of Alaska? The state of Alaska has filed a lawsuit against the federal BLM, Bureau of Land Matters, over an ownership dispute for a section of the Kanik River. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. K-N-I-K. The controversy surrounds who ultimately has authority over the submerged land between Friday Creek and the Kanik Glacier. The state argues it's been there since statehood, but the federal government argues since it's not a navigable passageway, it's under BLM control. When the state of Alaska was conveyed its land after statehood was granted, it was given ownership of those navigable waterways within state boundaries. I would have preferred to avoid litigation, but the federal government refused to recognize the state's rights to these lands and waters. Attorney General Jana Lindemuth wrote in a press statement, The area has been debated for decades, but since the BLM decided to convey that portion of the Kanik River to the Eklutna Incorporated Native Corporation as part of the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, the state is suing, saying the U.S. government can't transfer ownership of what they believe to be state land. Can you float a boat of sufficient size down this waterway so it can act as a highway of commerce? Assistant Alaska Attorney General Jesse Alloway said to sum up the question at hand, the state has always believed it owned the submerged lands of the Kanik River. The U.S. government has 60 days to respond to this lawsuit. As we start to wrap up this Food World Order edition of Your Morning Monarchy, I will tell you again, it is official. The West Virginia governor has signed that medical marijuana law, making West Virginia the 29th state to have medical marijuana. There will be no smoking. There will be no edibles. Just tinctures and oils and such. Speaking of oils and such, an interesting one from the Willamette Week, one of the weekly free papers here in Portland that I've pretty much stopped reading. Both of them are mostly rags pushing corporate agendas. They all love Hillary. They wanted to put fluoride in my water. And once something called Bands in Town came along, I pretty much stopped reading the crappy local papers altogether because for the most part, I was just looking for the concert listings. And now I don't need them for that. We're entering a new golden age of psychedelics and peak Portland is leading the way. If you ask around town, you'll find people who are saying we are entering a new golden age of psychedelics. The last headline for you, not about a golden age of psychedelics, but about genetic memories. The most important set of genetic instructions we all get comes from our DNA, passed down through generations. But the environment we live in can make genetic changes too. Researchers have now discovered that these kinds of environmental genetic changes can be passed down for a whopping 14 generations in an animal, the largest span ever observed in a creature, in this case being a dynasty of roundworms. 
To study how long the environment can leave a mark on genetic expression, a team led by scientists from the European Molecular Biology Organization in Spain took genetically engineered nematode worms that carry a transgene for a fluorescent protein. When activated, this gene made the worms glow under ultraviolet light. Then they switched things up for the nematodes by changing the temperature of their containers. When the team kept nematodes at 20 degrees Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit, they measured low activity of the transgene, which meant the worms hardly glowed at all. But by moving the worms to a warmer climate of 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, they suddenly lit up like little wormy Christmas trees, which meant the fluorescence gene had become much more active. Their tropical vacation didn't last long. When they moved back to cooler temperatures, they wanted to see what would happen to the activity of the fluorescence gene. Surprisingly, they continued to grow brightly, suggesting they were retaining an environmental memory of the warmer climate and that that transgene was still highly active. Furthermore, that memory was passed on to their offspring for seven brightly glowing generations, none of whom had experienced the warmer temperatures. Scientists have observed epigenetic memories being passed down for 14 generations. That and every other story we just discussed is all put together in a Twitter moment that we share at least an hour before showtime. Twitter.com slash Media Monarchy slash Moments. We put together the headlines ahead of showtime, and if you are here listening live, you can follow the bouncing ball, and you can see the stories that we discuss. And again, I, I advise that you also just go check out the hashtag Food World Order and see dozens, dozens, dozens more stories that were not discussed here. We're going to grow ideas in the garden of our mind as our song of the day coming up in just a few minutes. But let's take a look at this day in history, my friends. Past is prologue, April 26th, 1564. Playwright William Shakespeare is baptized in Stratford-on-Avon. Date of actual birth is unknown. April 26th, 1803. Thousands of meteor fragments fall from the sky of La Gille, France. The event convinces European scientists that meteors exist. April 26, 1933, on this day, the Gestapo, the official secret police force of Nazi Germany, is established. And so we talked about Merck's Zostavax, but on this day, April 26th in 1954, the Salk polio vaccine field trials involving 1.8 million children begin at the Franklin Sherman Elementary School in Spookville, McLean, Virginia. For the first time, a preventative vaccine is in sight. But soon, perhaps within a year, there may be a vaccine. A vaccine available to all that may be the answer. You see, there's so much hope now, because this year we may have a vaccine that will stop crippling polio. Help your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis to store up supplies of the Dr. Salk polio vaccine. It's all because of a thing called polio. Now, I know you've heard of polio because you've been given your polio shots. But I was just wondering whether or not the discovery of the Salk vaccine made you forget about the kids who are still crippled. I'm asking for children who are casualties on the battlefields of infantile paralysis. For them, the vaccine came too late. For them, the vaccine came too late. The salt vaccine came too late, but these boys and girls didn't get their polio shots in time. As a result of polio, the vaccine can't help them now. Yes, but to fight polio this year will take a lot of money. $64 million. $64 million? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. And send your mercy dollars and dimes to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Send your contributions to your local March of Dime headquarters today. Send your dimes and your dollars into the, into the nearest March of Dimes headquarters. Send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Give every dime and dollar that you can spare to the 1954 March of Dimes. And that's what every good American should do. Join the March of Dimes. Aw, thanks, Mickey Rooney and Lucille Ball and that strange one-eyed Jewish Satanist named Sammy Davis Jr. The vaccine can't help them now. It's a little bit of vaccine propaganda for you. And it didn't include anything. There was nothing in there about the contamination of the SV-40 with the polio vaccine that probably gave millions of people cancer. No one wants to talk about that. They just want to talk about the good stuff. 
This day in history, April 26th, 1960, forced out by the April Revolution, the president of South Korea, Syngman Rhee, resigns after 12 years of dictatorial rule. Past is prologue. April 26th, 1977, Studio 54 opened on this day in New York City. And in 1981, Dr. Michael R. Harrison of the University of California San Francisco Medical Center performs the world's first open fetal surgery. April 26, 1982, Joe Strummer disappears for about a month, causing the Clash to cancel their UK tour. And it seems like it's always a day of disasters. And again, that aforementioned Reddit post about all the things going on, all the things swirling around Trump, April 26th. There's a lot of explosions and a lot of chaos and a lot of coups that happen on this day in history. April 26th, 1986, a nuclear reactor accident occurs at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Soviet Union, now Ukraine, creating the world's worst nuclear disaster. April 26th, 1989, the deadliest tornado in world history strikes central Bangladesh, killing upwards of 1,300, injuring 12,000, and leaving as many as 80,000 homeless. That same day, the People's Daily in China publishes the April 26th editorial, which inflames the nascent Tiananmen Square protests. Now, on this day in 1999, Geffen Records and Bong Load filed suit against Beck in Los Angeles, California. The short version of this is that when Beck signed to Geffen, he had his own bong load records that he had started. And they basically made the deal of, okay, well, Geffen will put out some of your records, but you'll also get to kind of indie release some of your stuff yourself on your little bong load thing. That's why those early Beck albums have Geffen and bong load labels both on them. It's not uncommon for a smaller band, when they sign to a major, to let their indie label that they were on get a little bit of that lucre. And they'll usually get some co-deals in the, in the transfer, in the sign-over. Same thing happened with White Stripes. Same thing happens with lots of bands. But what happened was, Odile was supposed to just come out on bong load, but Geffen Records invoked a clause that basically said, ah, 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 I know we said we'd let you do what you think you want to do, but in this case we're saying no. Geffen put it out themselves, at which point Beck tried to basically breach a contract and they sued him. That's what happens when you get into bed with these fucks. That's just another example of what happens when you sell out to them. Continuing to look at this day in history, April 26, 2005, under international pressure, Syria withdraws the last of its 14,000 troop military garrison in Lebanon, ending its 29-year military domination of that country. You can see more about the Syrian occupation of Lebanon. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Media Monarchy's been online since September 11, 2005, and there are 11,000-plus articles, and I love to show some of the articles that we published this day in history. Ten years ago today, within 200 yards of Orwell's former residence is over 32 CCTV cameras, including the gardens Orwell viewed from his windows, which are covered by 24-hour surveillance from two CCTV cameras. Orwell's house surrounded by CCTV cameras, and we would, of course, learn not too much later that all those cameras in the UK did very, very, very little, next to nothing, to stop crime. They like to sell it to you as they're going to stop crime. They like to sell it to you as, what about the children? Also published to Media Monarchy 10 years ago today, Japan's abhorrent practice of enslaving women to provide sex for its troops in World War II has a little-known sequel. After its surrender, with tacit approval by U.S. occupation authorities, Japan set up a similar comfort women system for American GIs, it was revealed. Both those articles published to Media Monarchy April 26, 2007. Celebrating birthdays today, Ma Rainey and Rudolph Hess. Fame director Douglas Sirk, I. M. Pei, Carol Burnett, Dwayne Eddy is still alive. It's his birthday. Giorgio Mortar was just in town. I missed him. It's his birthday today. It's Gary Dreamweaver Wright's birthday and two fantastic drummers, Roger Taylor from Queen and Chris Marr from The Replacements. It's also Jet Li's birthday, Kevin James's birthday, our first lady, 
Melania Trump celebrating a birthday today. Channing Tatum, Miss Dynamite, and the recently mentioned Jessica Lynch from West Virginia. They tried to use her as war propaganda, but it backfired. Just like it did in some ways, though not as successfully, with Pat Tillman. We just talked about that the other day. This was new to me, and I thought actually the folks at Activism Media on the tweets made this song. But once I poked around a little bit more, it's actually a couple of years old, and it's from a guy who basically makes remixes and calls himself Melody Sheep. You can grow ideas in the garden of your mind, and I think it's a nice little positive way to wrap up this Food World Order episode. And we hope you'll tell people about Media Monarchy. Like I said, we've been around for almost 12 years. We are independent, non-commercial alternative media that is brought to you by you. You've never seen an ad. You've never heard a pitch. None of that. We are independent. We are truly DIY. That's part of my heart and that's part of my soul. You can hear these shows and know that I'm not making this up and I'm not just talking out of one side of my mouth. This is what I've done with my life. And I'm proud to do it. And I'm proud to have you along for the ride. And I'm humbled by your support at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's how we can keep going and growing, my friends. Growing ideas in the gardens of our minds. As we wrap up your Wednesday Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy for April 26th, 2016. Hope you join us in about two hours live for your daily DJ set at noon. We call it Pump Up the Volume. That's right. An hour of news in the morning is your Morning Monarchy and an hour of music in the afternoon. And it's all brought to you by you. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Thanking you so much for listening, my friends, and reminding you, as always, don't hate the media. Become the media. Take care. My neighbor, welcome again to this neighborhood. I'd like to show you something. You know what this is? Maybe if I press this button. This is a cassette player with a little cassette in here, and there's nothing written on it. So we'll just have to play it to see what it is. Do you ever imagine things? Are they scary things? Are they scary things? Do you ever imagine things? Do you imagine the things you'd like to have? You'd like to Did you ever see a cat's eyes in the dark and wonder what they were? What they were? Did you ever pretend about things like that? Did you ever pretend about things like that? Did you ever grow anything in the garden of your mind? You can grow ideas in the garden of your mind. It's good to be curious about many things. You can think about things and make believe. All you have to do is think and they'll grow. Imagine every person that you see is somewhat different from every other person in the world. Some can do some things, some can do some things, some can do others. Did you ever think of the many things you learned to do? Many things you did you ever grow anything in the garden of your mind? You can grow ideas in the garden of your mind. It's good to be curious about many things. You can think about things and make believe. All you have to do is think, and they'll grow. Did you feel like going like that? Let's give the fish some food. Mr. McFeely, I didn't order any whistles. That's what they call a slide whistle. There are so many things to learn about in this world, and so many people who can help us learn, and so many people who can help us learn. Did you ever grow anything in the garden of your mind? In the garden of your mind. You can grow ideas in the garden of your mind. In the garden of your mind. It's good to be curious about many things. You can think about things and make believe. All you have to do is think. You can think about things and make believe. All you have to do is think, and they'll grow. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, 
technology and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.